everybody for joining us and welcome to the changing face of insurance. Um, I'm Sam Vickerman, I'm the practice director for both insurance and retail at, here at Grace and uh, just to give you a bit of insight into what Grace does, we discover and develop emerging talent. So we work with nationwide organisations, providing resource for tech, data and um, change roles. My role essentially is to support and ensure that clients get the full potential from our analysts and consultants and that the service is as expected and then some, which, uh, you know, thankfully to the guys on the uh, call today, I'm sure they'll uh, agree. So insurance itself, why are we doing the webinar? Well, it's going through quite a bit of a facelift. So um, increased focus on improving the customer journey transparency and treating customers fairly, but also with a more digitally savvy population now, making sure insurance more accessible um, is becoming vital and innovation is key to enable that to happen. With this though, the digital skills gap continues and the need to attract and build digital skills is ever increasing. Um, this is highlighted recently by a survey by PwC and Insurance Ireland, which said over 70% of insurance companies are experiencing skill shortages across their digital technology. So we're here to hear firsthand on how the industry is facing into the changing face of insurance. Um, we're going to ask some questions of the, of the uh, people on our panel. We're going to get Ben to introduce them. Part way through, I'm going to wake you all up and have a little bit of a quiz, so a bit of a fun insurance fact quiz, and then Ben is going to continue with the questions, and at the very end, there's an opportunity for you guys listening in to ask us some questions, and we can put those to the panel. So thank you for joining us, really excited about this event, and I'm going to pass over to Ben. Bro, thanks, Sam, and lovely intro as well. I'll give my sort of elevator pitch in 30 seconds to a minute, and then pass on to the rest of the panel. So joined Grace in 2018 and joined RSA um, on behalf of Grace at the start of last year. Time's gone really quick. Um, I'm a PMO consultant, works on different programs and overlooking projects as a whole. Sam Bramwell, which you, you'll see is on the panel. She's actually my assignment lead, so I better not ask her any really difficult questions because um, <laughs> I know I'll, I'll be getting those back. So that's a little bit about me. I'll pass on to Angela, Jonathan, Sam, and then Paul in that order, if that's okay. So, Angela, please, could you give us a, an intro for a minute, please? I can, yeah. So, um, I'm Angela Christian Pye, and I started my career in a banking industry, not insurance. So, I feel a little bit of a fraud because I've not spent all my career in insurance. However, um, I worked um, for 25 years at the Cooperative Bank, mostly in change roles, and latterly, um, looking at um, banking and insurance with co-op insurance. Some of my portfolio of change included the insurance industry as well. And then I moved to um, group where I now am the test practice manager and I have a team covering all the heritage brands who undertake um, test activity um, to protect our brand, our digital delivery pipeline, etc. cetera. Um, in my spare time, I am a school governor and my husband calls me a professional busybody. Um, I'm a school governor and um, I am a trustee of a local um, gymnastics club, which I know sounds a little bit strange, but my sons were into competitive gymnastics and um, I am a trustee of the management committee um, of the biggest single sport facility in the Northwest. They are. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely and great to hear about you outside of work, Angela. I negated to say that I'm an Arsenal fan because I, of the fear of everyone <laughs> dialing off the call. So, yeah, I'll pass on to you, Jonathan. Yeah, I've done it now. Too late. Well, I'll my pass name, on to you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. My name's Jonathan. I'm an Arsenal fan as well, Ben. So, that's all good. Oh. Um, I'm the business manager for the IT and data function um, at Beasley. So, I support our chief information officer and the chief data officer in all of the outcomes they're trying to achieve. Um, my, my background is very broad, which is probably why I do the job I do. So I started off um, running a couple of um, car rental branches for Enterprise Rent-A-Car for a few years. Then I moved into recruitment um, and got involved in the world of sales. Then I went into HR and did some HR project management. Um, then I came to Beasley and I worked as a HR business partner for a few years before moving over to become a, a business manager. So the breadth of my experience really helps me um, set up governance and 
um, define strategy and operating models and manage budgets and all that all that stuff that needs to happen to make sure that divisions are are running as smoothly as possible. In my spare time, apart from support Arsenal, um, <laughs> it doesn't take me long to start talking about CrossFit. I'm a very very keen CrossFitter, so um, I love to do that in my spare time. I'm also studying an MBA, so um, I do a lot of reading and write a few papers in in um, you know at the weekends and things like that. So uh, so that's me. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, over to you, Sam, and then on to you, Paul. Thanks, Ben. So I'm Sam Bramall. So firstly, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to share my thoughts and experience with you all today. And I do hope it gives you some further insight into the insurance industry. So I work within the UK change function in RSA. Um, I've recently been appointed as the UK head of PMO for RSA, which is very exciting. Um, I have over 15 years or plus experience in project delivery. Uh, lots of different industries, so similar to the other panellists, so from business services to financial. Um, I joined RSA in 2014 as a project manager and more recently moved into sort of leadership roles within the programme office. So I've got a really good balance of delivery, governance and assurance, which is really key to my role because I can kind of see both sides. Um, and as you know, Ben, in my own time, I have a very <laughs> keen interest in learning and development and coaching. Yeah. So I'm currently working towards an apprenticeship to gain uh, professional qualification in coaching because I really, truly believe and the benefit that it brings to our workforce so I'm always looking at ways on how to bring that to life within our organization and that's me thanks sir uh, on to you, Paul. Thank, thank you Ben so hi I'm, uh, I'm Paul Watkins I'm the UK and I change director for RSA I'm very excited to be here and thank you for the opportunity to share my views and to answer any questions you may have um, before I go on and talk about my experience, I just wanted to embarrass Ben and Sam. Uh, if you ever needed an example of what great looks like in a change management function, they're both good examples. Uh, so they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, we've got a lot happening and they're right at the heart of it. So uh, thank, thank you to both and hopefully that really embarrassed you. Um, so, so, I have, um, so I've got over 25 years experience in financial services, uh, ranging from building and leading uh, card payments processing capability for Visa, so Visa Europe in the day, uh, construction leadership of change management teams for Quilter, that is wealth management, and now for the last two years uh, with RSA in the insurance sector. I joined RSA uh, about eight weeks before the start of the pandemic, so January 2020, seems like a, a decade ago now. Uh, but over the last two years, we have transformed how we deliver uh, programs for RSA and we oversee the delivery of our busy but strategically important RSA change agenda. I've also worked with Grace over the past 15 or 20 years as I'm a keen supporter of the business proposition but more importantly I have a personal passion to help talent flourish within financial services. From my own experience trying to break into financial services was harder than it needed to be and therefore, I think uh, from working with Grace, I can offer a route into the market that also gives talent a foothold, but also means that I end up with a hungry, talented and passionate workforce. So overall, uh, a win-win. Hence why I'm really happy to be here. And thank you again for the opportunity. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and I appreciate that. I'm slightly embarrassed, but uh, it doesn't and negate from me asking you difficult questions <laughs> over the next uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start a little bit about why I think insurance is important and then ask the panel questions. So for me, insurance is something that benefits people, whether it's people, businesses, society, and in the event of you know the unwanted happening, we all have it really, whether it's travel insurance, car insurance, home insurance, pet insurance. So obviously a very important industry for, for us um, and, and people globally really um angela i was going to ask you the first question which is around insurance okay. very important industry but why do we think it needs to change by the title of this webinar and what is your organization doing to maintain a competitive edge um it's a good one really and um, and i found quite a stark difference when i joined the insurance industry from banking when um in banking it's about building long-term relationships you're not like not make money from a uh, relationship in the first four or five years our insurance is a little bit more you've got one year to make the difference so 
So um, I think where the industry is facing with the challenges of the FCA regulations around fair pricing, it's really turned retail insurance, um, specifically the market on its head. Um, the regulations have rightly challenged the industry to respond more in the interests of the customer um, and, and move in that direction. The car insurance industry, for example, is dominated by um, price comparison websites. You, you know what I mean there when I'm talking about the aggregators that so compare the market or money supermarket, which in terms of um, driving down price have really worked in the interest of the customer. But in terms of an insurance com company, they have heavily discounted in the first year to get business on the hope of being able to retain that business in the future. And therefore, um, longevity um, and those long relationships have been penalized because we price hike in the second and third years to recoup the losses that we've made in the first year to buy that yeah. business. So, so the transparency of that process and that challenge that um, the industry of uh, the uh, FCF setters, I think has really given a bit of a shake up in the market um, and for the customer's longer term interest rather than that short term price fix. Um, I think they've also challenged the, um, the market to review its operating model. So different organizations yeah. have a different response to that, but their whole charging mechanism and pricing mechanism have been challenged. So in so doing, um, they've had to review their operating model and their pricing approaches to meet the regulations, but still remain competitive and um, in the market and, and improve the customer service at the same time. So retention being the key there. Um, I think the regulatory changes have also meant um, brand recognition becomes more important. So understanding your customer and how they um, are more is, becomes much more important as well. So focusing on strong brands and developing them um, for the customer is even more important. Um, and I think the other thing that we're, we're going to see is smaller insurers have found that transition really difficult. Um, and it may also result in pressure on their business models. And we're going to see a little bit of a, a change and shake up in that market as well in terms of um, They've, left, they've been left with no choice but to look for sale or merger opportunities. So there's going to be a bit of a shake-up in that market as well. So the second part, you said, what have we done about that? Yeah, the competitive, to maintain that competitive edge. So, um, yeah. So our challenge is, is how do we give that experience to the customer uh, that they expect um, in every channel um, of their choice and allow that customer to seamlessly skip through those channels so, for example, they might start their, their purchase journey in the, um, the aggregator sites, the money supermarkets, and then complete that journey on our direct um, sites or even with a telephone call to, um, to our operators. So how can we seamlessly move that? So what we've done um, is develop that, um, those processes that are much more fit for that seamless transition between those channels. Um, we've focused on our customer journey from the sale to renewal to claim. So um, that, that loyalty and that brand loyalty is driven by that experience. Um, it needs to be easy, no matter what they're doing, and the services need to be predictable level to develop those long-term relationships. I would probably say that loyalty is really hard won and easily lost. You're only as good yeah. as your last interaction with that customer. So, you know, um, and we have retentions that are focused on, you know, if you had a really good experience in the claim process, you're more likely to renew because they looked after you last time, but you hope that you're not going to have a claim scenario. So how is that interaction across the way? Um, we've also worked to know our customer, so anticipating the customer needs. So we've worked on a data program that looks at um, our customer base across the board. So the Atlanta group is quite large in terms of its footprints and heritage brands. Um, and we are using that knowledge that we have of our customers to preempt those needs and better anticipate those needs and provide them um, with the correct authority, of course, uh, to respond to those <laughs> customer needs. So those are the areas that we've worked in really. Yeah, thanks, Angela. And I think that that's probably a quite a common theme with the customer in mind and being a change 
changing industry due to regulatory pressure or other external factors, um, it makes it a really important place to work. Uh, and caring about the people, as we talked about with the customers, um, is really important. Jonathan, I'll ask you sort of a similar question. Why do you think the insurance industry needs to change? Well, it's a, it's a big question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I, I work in a slightly different, my um, insurance company is all, we sell all our products through brokers. Um, so it's a business to business arrangement. And a lot of it goes through the Lloyds of London uh, marketplace. Now, yeah. I hope that the industry doesn't change dramatically because there's so many good things about it in terms of the people you meet, the companies you can work for, the experiences you can be open to, um, and the training development that's available to, to all employees that work in the industry. But I think for me, beyond the regulation and having to deal with the with regulatory impact of, of having to change your business or your business model, um, we need to keep evolving to adapt to our customer needs. And that can be from speed of transaction, um, throughout the policy life cycle and the claim life cycle, um, accuracy of coverage, um, being cost effective to do business with as a broker, um, be competitively priced, and also yeah. to, to really meet the customer where they want to do business. So yeah. where, how is it that we're doing? Yeah, how, how is it we want to do business? Where are our brokers hanging out? What's easy for them? And we'll go meet you rather than asking you to come, <laughs> come and meet us, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so to maintain competitive edge, Beasley does quite a lot, and it's we're quite an innovative company with lots of pockets of innovation happening everywhere, all which is all very, very customer focused. So to go through a bit of what we do, we, we've got a product incubation team where they look out across the, um, the market, um, across the globe and understand, right, well, what trends are there in technology um, or political, social, um, uh, economic um, environment? And what do we think we could build new products for or um, create uh, solutions for our customers to help them feel safe or do business or whatever it may be? Um, we've also got a product development team and they actually look internally. So they're looking they're speaking to our underwriters and our claims professionals and they're saying, well, OK, what type of products could we maybe position in different markets that we already have? Or how can we incrementally yeah. improve our current product suite um, to help serve our customers needs better? Um, within IT and operations, we're going through a huge modernization. So we are, I think everybody knows the B2B insurance is a little bit behind the times compared to banking or the B2C insurance market. But what that means is there's loads of opportunity for process improvement, for automation, um, for um, a, a wealth of technology that can help us support our, our business processes and help us satisfy our customer needs. So we're going through a big modernization there. Um, we're looking at our ways of working as well. So we've got a great yeah. HR function. We call them culture and people. And they're always producing new policies that um, uh, help us feel more comfortable at work and help us manage our work-life balance and be flexible with our working arrangements. And I'll probably talk about that a bit later on in some of the, I think, other questions that are coming up. Um, not that I know the questions that are coming up, Ben. Sorry. I <laughs> let that loose. Um, <laughs> we also sort of run hackathons and do loads of cool stuff where we involve our vendors and, and our employees in sort of being innovative and um, thinking about doing things differently. Um, and then finally, we, we build partnerships. So we have a, a really great innovation ecosystem. We, we bring vendors in to help us solve problems together. Um, we partner up with insure tech companies as well to see the cool stuff that they're doing. Um, and we're part of Lloyd's Innovation Hub as well, just to sort of really so create a, a community of people because we're not going to solve all these problems on our own we're better as a community we need to bring the insurance industry forward together and so we really believe in building partnerships as part of as part of what we do wow that's very important and a lot's going on there now I, I will touch upon some of what you've said in a in a question coming up so uh be on your Thank toes you. jonathan but on <laughs> on to paul obviously insurance to many although almost everyone has it as i said at the start of the webinar can seem like a bit of a black box so can you talk us a little bit about insurance and why it's changing as well yeah i think um so a lot of what i was going to cover really i think um uh, angela and jonathan have already touched upon but it, it, but it's it, it's really key because the behaviors and needs of our customers is changing customers including yeah. myself people that are on this call friends and family they want more flexibility optionality and people are therefore looking, I think, for consumption-based insurance products. So we know for, for, from our own experiences, um, people's driving habits and driving behavior has changed during the pandemic. So therefore they're yeah. not using their cars the way they were. 
They're also looking for uh, uh, insurance that touches with reducing carbon footprint. So how do we as an insurance business and an RSA respond to that? Uh, and, and, and also, uh, how do we make it easier for people to deal with this? So to Angela's point, part of retention is also uh, buying the product, but also the claims experience. If you unfortunately have to, you know, you prong, prong, prang your car or do put, put, put a nail for a pipe when you're doing some work at home. But so therefore the customer experience, I think, is really important. Um, and it's not just about loyalty. It is just it is more importantly about retention. And that retention comes through offering bespoke risk based products unique to a customer needs and no longer one size fits all. The first class yeah. experience that I've spoken about, but also making sure that in the changing needs of the market, we provide a competitive price, but also insurance can make money. So there's a balance we have to continue to achieve uh, through that because it's all also about maintaining regulatory position. It's about having a happy customer base, but also it's revenue uh, as well. So we've got to make sure we balance yeah. that yeah. very carefully. So, yeah. so therefore, if I think about what RSA is doing in, in, in this space to help with maintaining in evolving our competitive edge, it, it's kind of, we're looking at three, three or four things. So exceptional insurance-based products. So we as an organization, as with the other organizations on the call, offer insurance from a single shop on the high street all the way through to multinational corporations. corporations. How do we do that? Uh, we've got to make sure we provide the right product and without any unnecessary bells and whistles that will never be used. So we just got to make sure we find the sweet spot. We've got to do pragmatic risk consulting. So therefore appropriate bespoke design cover, which means we need intelligent people based upon yeah. data and also decision-making to offer that to, to people. Reliable claim service, so ease and transparency is key. And also it's got to be designed by experts. And that's where people really are at the heart of insurance. <clears throat> when you then think of, of RSA, we've got two verticals. So we've got the commercial part of the business and then you've got the personal part of the business. Mm -hmm. Commercial covers construction, property, marine, motor fleet, renewable energy, rail and charities. So for example, the uh, if you remember the story of the huge container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, <laughs> six months or so, yeah. and it everything for six months or so uh, and we're still feeling the effects of it most of the ins insurance that was on, on of products on that ship was insured by rsa so that's the the reach that insurance has if you don't think of personal lines that's more of the uh, uh home insurance motor insurance and uh, pet insurance that you might recognize through brands like more than or, or smart wheels if you don't think of smart wheels that's an opportunity where technology innovation has helped drive appropriate price point for insurance because for entry-level insurance uh, drivers they used to be hit by quite a large cost when it came to their first year of insurance now, now that they can have smart wheels and we can track people's driving quality it enables us to manage the risk and therefore the price to the insurance to the to the individual so just an example so, so then if okay. i then quickly just talk about the the, the five or six things that uh, how rsa is facing into a post-pandemic world and believe me i'm really happy to be talking starting to talk past tense <laughs> current tense yeah right? are we, are we all? All? Oh, yeah. so, so looking back but also optimizing that position is rsa and other insurers has to remain open to new ideas even more than ever so jonathan mentioned innovation it has to be the core to what we do but also not yeah. innovate too fast beyond the needs and desires of the customer because it won't yeah. create stickability there's a an elastic band point there we need to maintain that we need to connect connect with the customer base in a different way so uh, establish and maintain deeper relationships through web portals chat hubs contact centers because it's more of a distant relationship but because things are changing you need to have a deeper relationship we've got to on evolve the online experience so provision of insurance for people that are working from home because yeah. hopefully we've got this hybrid working that's emerging and personally I'm a fan of online consultations for risk and insurance and then also provision of real-time educational content to brokers and to uh, people on the street to enable them to make risk-based decisions themselves around insurance rather than us telling them yeah. and yeah. another thing that's really important as well is through the pandemic the the use of community company local services and organizations increased by nearly 60 percent 
So where people are not traveling long distance, they are staying more local, they're investing in their local services and community. That therefore means the insurance to those local community has to change to reflect the increase of demand, but also the importance of them in our society. So, that, so that's a subtle shift. Yeah. And then finally, RSA, and I'm sure every other organization that's represented on this call is showing that they care for their people uh, because that's, that's really come to the front over the last couple of years. We need to put people first. There's a real drive to focus on well-being and health. We, we, we know that it's important and it's very current to do that. And then also make sure that the pastoral care part of everything we do is really benefited through our marketing and publicity to, to not only, to Angela's point, recognise the brand strength when it comes to regulatory response, but also if you're an organisation that cares, you can attract good people and retain good people as well. So that's, that's yeah. really key. Thanks, Paul. And I think you touched upon a lot of the trends there, as did, as did Jonathan. And um, no pun intended in, in terms of car insurance, but the black box you've really opened up and shown how fluid insurance is. And most importantly, I think for me, shown how insurance doesn't just change due to regulation, it changes to everyday market conditions. Um, Angela, as Jonathan and Paul have talked about trends um, I wanted to know what you've seen uh, in terms of trends in the insurance industry and then we'll go on to Sam uh, to go to the poll. Okay so I think um, customer trends um, customer expectations have rapidly changed um, in recent years and I think I think Paul mentioned this in terms of expectations they've gone um, to have a much more Amazon expectation in their their insurance buying so they want yes. it today it's you know it's sorted within the next 24 hours so so their expectations have really changed and that that is partly because we've got a younger more tech savvy um customer base but also because it culturally our expectations have changed as well and um so so their expectations are a bit more like a pure retail environment i think paul you mentioned about you know um transactional um insurance you know insure me for a week because I'm doing a long journey and I need a different car. Yeah. I don't need a car all the time, for example. Um, so so that there's those changes. And I think COVID has really accelerated that, not only in the customer's expectations, but how customers want to interact. Swinton Insurance had quite a big, it had gone nearly before I I joined in, in 2018, but quite a brand high street presence. Those are days are gone. The customer, you know, gone are the days where the customer would go into a branch to purchase their, or even talk about their insurance policy. Yeah. And, um, and some of you younger guys won't even remember that happened before, but that's how it used to be. We used to have um, a branch network. So those days have gone. Um, customers demand, um, a simple, intuitive um, ex, uh, tra uh, transactions. So yeah, so they're looking for um, improved slickness of transactions as well. I think um, the biggest trend we've probably seen is the customer propensity to transact digitally as well. So it's not just yeah. us driving for you know the cost of servicing a customer down. The customer is demanding that anytime, mm -hmm. anywhere interaction. Um, so we've invested in um, digital channels, we've invested in um, improved telephony systems and platforms that go across the group, um, live chat and instant messages so that the customer can interact when they want, how they want, how they want. Um, yeah, so I think that's a good line there, it. Angela, as well, about the sort of digital journey and being able to access or purchase insurance wherever you are on whatever device. Um, we will come back to questions and I'm very keen to hear from Sam Bramwell on our next questions but I'll pass over to Sam Vickerman for the, for the poll. Thanks <laughs> and I feel really uh, bad now for breaking us up with a bit of a poll because uh, it's getting quite interesting <laughs> and really good insights. Here. As promised we'll go to a quick poll make sure everybody's wide awake on the call that are listening into us. So first question for everybody what type of insurance has the highest market share in the UK at around 70%? So obviously listening to the guys talking, they referenced a number of different types of insurance today. Which one has 70% of the market? 
Shame we're not allowed to vote. What's, what's no, that? No, well. I was going to say, <laughs> Sam, you could have given us the answers before this. <laughs> okay, the answer was life insurance, believe it or not. So life insurance has the biggest uh, share of the market. Honestly, would have thought it was car insurance. Completely agree with you guys. So I think there's lots of wives and husbands insuring other halves and they're probably not aware of it for life insurance. So anyway, <laughs> really <laughs> on, that might be me. <laughs> which of these celebrity insurance policies is false? So not which is true, which is false. Kiss frontman Gene Simmons had his tongue insured for a million pound at the peak of his career. Influencer Kim Kardashian insured her famous derriere for 21 million. Footballer David Beckham had his legs insured for, in 2006 for 100 million. And wrestler Dwayne The Rock Johnson insured his back for 5 million in the early 2000s. Oh, wow. They could all be true. Great. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they could all be true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spread. So actually, the bulk of the audience were correct on that one. It was wrestler Dwayne The Rock Johnson. The rest is true. Kim Kardashian's yeah. uh, area and Beckham's legs. That that all happens through Lloyd's of London, the, the marketplace I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so well done. Question three. Which of these types of insurance have never existed? So bearing in mind, three out of these four do actually exist. Alien abduction. So this is to protect you against UFO abduction. A change of heart insurance covering the cost of your wedding if you get cold feet. A false witch hunt, which covers the cost of damages if you're proven to be falsely accused of witchcraft. And injury by falling coconut insurance for those tropical holidays away. Guess away, guys. So, so Sam, I was talking about life and pet insurance at the start, and now you're coming in with all these different things it could be insured on. No, did you? So the audience have incorrectly guessed alien abduction. That is actually an insurance policy. Um, the one that is false on those is the witch hunt. So there is no witch hunt insurance. If you get accused of witchcraft, you're stuffed. <laughs> That's it for the panel for the questions. Now over to the most serious panel questions that Ben's going to continue with. So thanks, guys. Thank, thanks, Sam Vickerman. So we're going to hear from Sam Bramwell now. And I know you touched upon at the start around your passion for coaching RSA people and development. So I wanted to hear more about how RSA are developing fresh talent and why that's important. Oh, you know, people is like the, my, the topic I enjoy yeah. talking about the most. So uh, I'm glad I got this one. Um, well, first of all, I think it's such an exciting industry to work in. It's so fast paced. And in fact, it's the most fastest paced environment I've ever worked in. And I've worked in so many industries. Um, you know, we have to use innovation to meet the needs of our customers. So it's just a great opportunity for part of that transformation and evolution. Um, I think from my experience, you know, people nowadays expectations on what employers can offer has changed so much. You know, they want to join a company whose purpose goes far beyond profitability. It's not just about the role from a day to day point of view, but it's about company values. They want to know where we stand on DNI, social, environmental issues, health, well-being. You know, and, and we as an organization are very passionate about raising awareness of these topics, you know, including yeah. how we're committed to meeting our climate change commitments. So I think I think people want to work in an environment where career progression is clear, you know, and they're motivated by opportunities. They witness people moving around between different jobs. And I think it's empowering and drives such a positive culture, you know, and ultimately at the end yeah. of the day, an empowered team becomes adaptable to change um, and helps us drive and implement new ideas. I guess in terms of attracting talent, you know, uh, we've, we've moved so far, haven't we, from, from those days of recruitment agencies. So we have to be creative. So it's not just about picking up a telephone and, and you know, and, and interviewing over Zoom anymore. Um, you know, we need to be creative and, and almost think about how we create an immersive experience that enables people to really fully understand yeah. what it's like to do those specific jobs. Um, open days are a great option uh, and, and really utilising social media more and more to really promote what we do and what our organisation is all about. 
And we also need to provide our kind of hiring managers with the toolkit that emphasize what we have to offer in terms of development opportunities, apprenticeships and career progression. Yeah, that's does that's that... very comprehensive, Sam. That does answer my question Sorry, as that, well. Sorry, you, think... you, can, you can see my passion, can't you? I can, I can see <laughs> it coming through and, I, and I've seen it on conversations we've had as well. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It's people uh, care about ED and I even more and show yeah, that even absolutely. more and the sustainability. And it's about mm. bringing your whole self to work, which if an 100%. organization can encourage that and bring that to life, then you're, uh, exactly. yeah, so you, you're attracting new talent. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. Thanks, Sam. Um, Jonathan, I'll ask you the same question. Why do you think attracting, attracting I should say, fresh talent is so important? Well, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Sam. We should probably hang out because I love coaching. <laughs> One of my biggest, biggest things. Yeah. <laughs> and I think creating great places for people to work, be that from IND activity, well-organized companies, a great strategy, a great purpose is just something I absolutely love to, to talk about and, and implement. So I think when it comes to BZ, we're, we're really focused on building a, a great company and, and that should do the talking for you, I believe. And as long as you get your, your marketing right, the company you build should should follow through and, and attract the right people. So, as I say, it can, it can be HR policy. So we don't actually have working hours. You you have a thirty five hour working week as your part of your contract, but you can fulfil that however you want, which is fantastic. We do shared parental leave for for parents. Um, you get a free lunch at BZ as well, which is you know something that's that's means you don't have to worry about going to going to prep. There, there is such a free is a there is such a there thing. Is as a free well, you have to work. It, you have to work, right? But you know it's it's <laughs> you have to put your pocket and money in your hand in your pocket. Um, and and we're really flexible with where you work as well. So we've got great office spaces, but um, you can work from home whenever you want and and be as flexible as you like around that. Um, we focus on our leaders. So across IT and data, I've been implementing a coaching culture um um program for the past two years which is sort of helping our our leaders lead better and and ask ask questions rather than tell but also help us interact with the rest of these as well because in a it and data world things can become very complicated very quickly so you have to be able to empathize with the the people around you to be able to solve their solve their problems um we've got a huge focus on ind and i've been told to plug so i'm going to plug on friday <laughs> next week we are um, going to we're going to be presenting at the tech talent um, women in women in tech um tech talent event that's happening in central london so we've got a um uh, a stand there so please come and see us and, and talk to us about what we're doing in um the wonderful world of tech um we've also re fairly recently hired a head of sustainability to look at responsible business because that's something that's really important to us as well um we invest huge amounts in learning and development um and we love to partner with people like grace as well who, who also do the same and so it kind of it's a really good marriage um to, to partner with companies like that um our workspaces are really important to us as well. So even though it's flexible, we want you to be in the office sometimes to, to you know, do, do the things you need to do. But we, we provide spaces to, you know, quiet spaces called a library to do your, your spreadsheets or your papers or whatever. We've got collaboration zones. Um, we've got presentation areas and all this sort of thing. So we like to, um, you know, think about that as part of our uh, building a great business. Um, and then what people forget about as well, the work is actually quite fun. Which, which should attract you to, to the insurance industry, working for an insurance company, because it is fun. There's, there's loads of cool problems to solve. It's very customer centric. Um, mm -hmm. It's vibrant and it's exciting. Um, and, and you're surrounded by great people. Um, and so that should really, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the nail in the coffin. So everybody should be interested in working for an insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a really great sales pitch there Jonathan I think it is a can you yeah, tell I work in said. sales could you tell that I work in sales we, we can tell <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't work in insurance uh, before I, did, I would now um yeah building that right infrastructure for people it, it exactly. sounds like exactly, exactly the right thing to do and <laughs> I've found a lot of people in the insurance that I've, I've worked with have been in insurance for many many years and, and don't leave the industry which is really important um, I'm conscious of time and I know I did promise Sam I said we'll get to a QA, and a so I must leave some time for that but Jonathan we talked about trends earlier that you've seen now what sort of upcoming trends do you see in the near future? Well I had to do a bit of canvassing for this so I'm, I'm, and I'll, I'll answer quickly so everybody else can have a have a go as well but um, as I mentioned there's, there's going to be more partnerships we can't solve this on our own we can't wow all our customers on our own so there'll be more of that 
Um, and yeah. that's with insure techs, with, with vendors, with other insurance companies, with our brokers, et cetera. Um, there will be much more tech. Tech is with us. Tech is developing at a huge rate. You know, we're looking to harness automation and robotics, data science, anything that can improve our processes and get as close to our customers as possible. Um, agile ways of working as well. If you're listening in, you don't know what agile is, learn because it's something that is how a lot of change organizations yeah. will, will be run. Um, and it's something that really helps you um, test and learn, deliver iterative um, value for the company. Um, and it's a great way of getting close to business problems as well. Um, and then there's loads of stuff around products, which you know we can talk about things like space industrialization, nanotechnology, water wow. supply issues, aging population. We've got all these external factors we need to think about as well. So there's, there's those trends to, to consider too. Um, but I think just to, to, to sign off this point, there was one trend that won't change is that good people who work hard will always do well in the insurance industry. And so that's, that's, that, that's a trend that's here to stay. Wow, thank you. Yeah, that's a good ending point on there. And I, I'm sure that our panel... Uh, we'll be getting some LinkedIn messages about insurance and uh, and the next upcoming yeah, trends. Yeah, send them, over. Stay send them over, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're welcomed by our panel, as you can see, uh, the audience. So, Angela, I'll ask you the same question around around trends. So, um, I think, you know, Jonathan, you've touched on quite a few of the ones. So I'm just going to skim through. Um, I think one of the um, approaches that Atlanta has, so Atlanta, I think, um, has gone through a process of um, transition in the fact there's a number of different companies that have been brought together under the Atlanta brand. So I think Sam, you mentioned about the um, the culture and the values of an organisation are really important. And what we've we've gone through um, in Atlanta is try to confirm what Atlanta is. So rather than you know you've got your Swinton values, you've got um, the culture of Carol Nash, the culture of AutoNet. So we're going through that process of redefining and reforming what those values are. So I think it's really important for the company to be cohesive and move forward. But the way we've done that is actually making sure we've had our colleagues involved in that. So it's a colleague-led set of values um, to, that, that drives that cohesion that we can all get behind. And I think that will really help. Um, one of the other things, um, not mentioned by you, Jonathan, in terms of attraction of talent is we've also looked for offshore partnering. So there has been, um, we found it particularly difficult, and I think Sam, you mentioned it earlier, um, tool savvy um, talent, especially in the Manchester and Stoke area that's had a bit of a boom in that, um, that area. And the Atlanta response has been to, we looked at near shore, um, you know, Eastern Europe and in European solutions. Um, and we and then had to look a little bit wider than that because we felt that we weren't going to be able to attract the talent that we needed in the near shore environment. A lot of the banks have already done that. So we've partnered um, offshore in Vietnam. So we're, we're in a partnership with um, uh, Nash Tech Global, which is part of the Harvey Nash Group. Um, and we've got offshore development teams that have, have become an intrinsic part of our, our Atlanta family, really. So we don't regard them as a third party supplier. They're an extension of our existing digital development teams. And that partnership, the common language and that um, cultural engagement with those groups is really important. And I think um, I think it's one of the things you mentioned before about the, the agile delivery. It's absolutely bringing home how that is really important in those digital spaces and working with those third party partners. Um, and obviously, from my point of view, something I'm really keen about, because in terms of a test manager, we're looking to drive quality through that delivery pipeline. So therefore, understanding and having transparency in that relationship is really important, too. Uh, and that's what I think, I think I've heard a lot thing... on this call, uh, Angela. So, sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say uh, that's what I've heard right. a lot on this call about uh, partnership. And um, that seems mm -hmm. to be a, an upcoming trend going forward. Obviously, all of the organisations on this call work with Grace. Um, and I've seen that partnership flourish over many months and, and years for some organisations. So that seems like an upcoming trend as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just I'll, I'll pass on to Paul to get Paul's view. And I know, Sam, you'll have a view as well about trends. You're always looking forward. So um, we'll go into Paul uh, and then Sam, and then we'll go into Q&As. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ben. So, so I think... Um, 
the insurance market is dealing with the challenges that the banking industry and financial services dealt with maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. So one, one of those is disruptive innovators, right? So a lot of our financial insurance products are based upon technology that carries a lot of legacy debt and therefore yeah. transformation time and transformation investment is expensive and long. So the real risk, I think, to the insurance market is disruptive innovators that have got low technology costs in a cloud-based infrastructure, which is shared yeah. across the world, can manage data in a much more intelligent, regulatory compliant way than we do now. So they've designed it from the get-go the right way, and yeah. therefore they can be nimble. So, so I think part of, part of the, the next wave is going to be disruptive innovators into the market that can offer consumable and behavior based insurance because i personally get irritated when i look out the window and i see my car parked on the drive in 30 years i've never had someone hit me on the drive right so why <laughs> can't, why yeah. can't my insurance be different when i'm driving it because i've got a mobile phone in my pocket that knows i'm moving as opposed to being sat on my drive why can't it be different right so it's very futuristic yeah. paul and i like that yeah so I'm going to I'm going to claim that idea. If anyone wants to invest, <laughs> Dragon, Dragon's Den, just give me a call. <laughs> but, but, but I think I think the point is the challenge is disruptive innovation. The opportunity is connectivity between data, technology, and intelligence in talented people to come up with ideas that the, the banking industry dealt with ten years ago. And I think the final one for me is listening and responding to the drumbeat of society. One of them is carbon neutral, climate neutral. So therefore, yeah. for example, if for, for some for some reason my house was, bit, was burning down right now, why can't it be rebuilt using carbon neutral products that have been sourced in a sustainable way? And I would be prepared to pay an insurance premium for that. So, so there's a need to kind of connect our products to the voice of society, but also protect our, uh, sorry, connect our services to the threat of disruptive innovation that I think is, is coming from non-corporation size organizations that are building or existing today. I completely agree, Paul. That, that is one of the things that we were, we're saying is, you know, as well as the regulatory, um, there's still gonna be more regulatory change that we're all gonna to need to respond to. I think um, industry disruptors, as you say, is where we're, we're seeing our challenge come from. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Angela. And, and Sam, just to close on that last question around trends that we see going forward, what are your views? I think we've got some 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 great feedback already. So I know I'm just conscious of the time. So you know, at a very headline level, it's it's continuing to be sort of more flexible. And for me, it's about simplifying that purchasing process. And I say that from from a personal perspective. You know, yeah. when you're going through that customer journey and you've got streams and streams of of, of questions, it's it's simplifying that process so that perhaps I don't know some of that information is auto filled so I think you know data yeah. and analytics is going to play such a massive you know role in that going forward um, and yeah. as long as role profiling you know and those you know if you're thinking about Facebook and those algorithms that work in the background and work out what your next move is going to be <laughs> all of that is 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 you know it is going to be a big part going forward so let well we'll see much more of that um, and I think self-serve as well. I think we just need to look across all of our customer groups. It's not just about, you know, our policyholders, but thinking to Jonathan's point and brokers, it's about enabling that service offering for them as well. So it's just expanding that out. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's such a customer focused industry mm. that so we want to align with what the customer wants, but also to look that step ahead to get that competitive yes. advantage. So. Yeah, very good answers there across the panel. Uh, I'm not surprised at all as you're all seasoned in your roles and in the industry. Um, but that, those are my questions. I know Sam's going to post some questions from the audience, which may be equally as tricky. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm looking at the questions that have come through and some of them have been answered. So not too hopefully challenging. Well, I'm team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ask me each one of the questions. I'll split them between you all. So uh, the first one, I'm going to go to Sam because you're particularly passionate about this subject. So what, oh, advice, <laughs> what advice would you give to a graduate or a young professional starting out their career in the insurance industry? And what are the top skills that you'd be looking for? 
great question. Mm, if I'm just thinking about the, the types of candidates that I, I just think somebody who's kind of quite adaptable to change. I mean, especially if I think mm. purely for my, my, from the area that I recruit in, it's governance, you know, um, we are heavily regulated. There's a lot of information. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's a, it's just having a really good attitude. That's what I always look for is somebody who's got a, a really good attitude, who can work with people, um, who's dynamic. Um, because sometimes you have, you're thrown in situations where, you know, you don't always have the resources around you. Um, it's not always ideal. And sometimes you have to build that knowledge and get kind of stuck in. Um, but it's, a, as, I, as I repeat what I said earlier, it's such an exciting industry to work in. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, some great opportunities. I don't know if that's answered the question at all. Yeah, but. That brilliantly answered. Thank you. Um, no we go to Jonathan for the next one. So <laughs> we've talked about trends already, but given that the biggest driver probably for change over the last couple of years has been COVID, what do you predict is going to be the biggest kind of change driver for insurance going forward? Oh, wow. That's, That's huge. An easy question. <laughs> We're not even done with COVID it's yet. Hard. So it's, it's, hard, it's hard to predict the future at the moment because as much as we, we are a bit more free to move around, COVID is still very much there and um, we've just got to be really aware of that. But I think... Um, what we what we could be better at, I think, in the insurance and what will drive train is how we how we um, turn data into a true asset. Mm -hmm. Insurance insurance companies have so much data available to them about their customer, um, and for, for a customer for, for the business side, you've got in, in, the data about your your broker as well as your customer. There's so much you can do with that, and I think that is an area that needs to be massively improved to be able to exploit yeah. all of that. Um, information and turn it into something of value so data is is going to be on the, the everybody's lips over the next few years for sure and it's definitely a growth area for us as well mm. I think yeah. that's something that appeals to a lot of our grads as they're coming through which is great uh, right I'm going to go to Paul for the next one <laughs> okay what do you think is the biggest challenge in terms of implementing change within insurance I think it is twofold. I think first is the ambition for change is huge. Yeah. So therefore you can get swamped in the actual amount of change you have to do. So however good your organization is at executing on change, realizing the benefits of change, if you've got too much happening, you just can't, you can't move forward. So you have to be really precise in my language, what are the four or five big boulders that the organization wants to get its shoulder behind to move them forward and not worry about the stones and the pebbles, right? You just have to focus on those boulders. Yeah. I think I think the second piece is, um, yes, insurance companies are becoming more innovative in how they operate and how they think and how they execute, but they're still working into a market which is probably not that well align to the pace of change that's required yeah. so, so there's a real need to educate the customer groups and these are probably more on the commercial side than on the personal side because we, we've already spoken about the personal behaviors and they're driving innovation on the commercial side it's probably more static and we need to really drive that and that is where the real opportunity lies uh, and therefore, we have to work slightly faster than, than they can cope with, but not too fast. So there's a little bit of a risk there that we need to take people on the journey with. But, but, but I think, therefore, what we need and the type of people we need in insurance are people that are not worried by barriers. They're not worried about guidelines or guide rails. They are prepared to accept risk and deal with it and keep focused on what they need to achieve and which boulder we need to push forward on. Because the risk that can happen is people get so focused on the stones and the pebbles, they lose sight of the boulders. And my single piece of advice to the graduates that wish to join us is keep an eye on your boulders. Don't lose sight of those because that is what yeah. will make the difference. That's what you'll be measured and that's what you'll succeed mm. on. Yeah, that's brilliant. And that that is such true. a good analogy, isn't it? Brilliant. And it partially answers yeah. the last question that was going to come to Angela for the last bit, which was, we've talked quite a bit about attracting people to the insurance um, industry. And we've seen there's some really kind of powerful stuff to get involved in transformationally. 
why do you think it's important for the insurance industry and insurance companies to actually have that diverse young talent and attract those young people to the organization? Because I know, you know, we, we've talked also that a lot of people stay in insurance, but actually what about attracting fresh blood to it? And why is that important to you? So I, I think um, we, we need a, um, a, an employee base that is, representative of what our customers want so we can start to think like our customers mm. and you know I'm really conscious of you know and an, uh, being an over 40 woman that thinks like an over 40 woman with teenage children I don't think like my 18 year old son who will be the future purchaser of car insurance for example and um, so we need to attract that talent to ensure that we respond and reflect more of what our customers want that is basic and that's not specific to insurance companies that's across the board I think the second thing to remain competitive we, we need to attract the best talent because we need to have the innovative the flexible the change to think differently to think out the box and that's not always easy but that's what we need to do and um, one of the challenges Atlanta have faced is because Atlanta as a brand is quite new but the heritage organizations to sit underneath it it's quite hard to sell something that is new because people don't know what they're buying into, they don't know what they're, they're joining, they don't know what the picture is. So that's where we've been working as an organisation to try and attract talent and to promote the Atlanta brand and what that means to us rather than work for Swinton or, uh, or one of the other brands. I think, so to stay ahead of the, of the market, to stay ahead of um, and advance our customer experience are two good reasons why we need to attract new talent does Brilliant. that answer your question sam it absolutely does and to be honest, I've had more questions than ever before coming through today, uh, which is brilliant. Yeah, that's good. Know, we're hitting the right kind of um, correct level of information and audience are loving it. So I'm really sorry we haven't got to answer all your questions. And I actually will look at some of the themes that have come through. And if you guys don't mind on this panel, we might reach out to you to no, get not at all. answers. Uh, yeah, 100%. Okay. And we'll yeah, do, a, do a bit of an article or a show and tell on kind of some of those because uh, there's some brilliant ones could just come through as well. So thank you for your time. Absolutely um, loved the last hour. It's flown by. You've all given us some great insight into the insurance industry, why we should join it, what's changing and why it's changing. And uh, I, for one, am truly excited about what the next few years bring. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you.